And have you filled up yet? Gas prices in the GTA are headed for a big jump at midnight. I gotta fill up today before uh, I get ping tomorrow. You still have a bit of time to top up your tank if you haven't yet. Gas prices expected to jump by 10 cents when the clock strikes 12, with another jump expected later in the week. Plus... In these cases, there were firearms used in these. Sometimes we're seeing knives. Sometimes we're used, uh, physical force is used. Toronto Police giving an update on the spike in carjackings we've been seeing across the city, saying they've made two arrests and identified two other suspects. And... Oh, I'm pumped. Everyone jumps on board. It's the energy in the city is electric. Toronto is ready as the Jays clinch home field advantage in the wildcard series that begins on Friday. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. Many drivers are rushing to fill up their tanks tonight with the price at the pumps expected to make a big jump at midnight. Experts say we should brace ourselves for a 10 cent hike. That would make it one of the biggest single day jumps the province has seen in a decade. And as Patrick Swadden explains, this gas price roller coaster is likely far from over. I wasn't aware it's going 10 cents up tonight, so I guess I'm one of the lucky ones. Ali Khan Jamal isn't the only one filling up in Toronto today. With prices expected to jump by a dramatic 10 cents overnight, drivers are eager to gas up, while others are considering how much they need to drive at all. I'll probably not be going as, you know, many places, unfortunately. They're already at a high price and they're just getting higher, so that's outrageous. Gas prices just went down, but if they're going up again, it's probably going to get unaffordable. Now I've been driving less and taking the TTC. Dan McTagg, president of Canadians for Affordable Energy, says the price jump is because OPEC nations have said they plan to cut production significantly. The world is already in a very, very tight uh, oil uh, supply situation. So any additional decrease in that supply or planned or otherwise uh, will have the predictable effect of making prices uh, much higher. The latest increase will see gas prices go up to $1.63 per litre across much of Ontario. It's a far cry from what the province saw in early June when prices were over 60 cents higher per litre than what they are today, and even further from gas prices in BC, which are currently in the 230s. But McTagg says part of the problem is countries can't get their energy to market right now. No one really has spare capacity to increase production in order to meet uh, global demand, which is still very strong. He says we shouldn't expect the roller coaster to stop anytime soon. I don't think it's stability anytime soon. We're looking at a, an inflationary spiral created very much by uh, an energy crisis. With the added chance of another four cent hike Thursday, some drivers are thinking about other options. I ride my bike more often now and I, w I try walking and things like that. To alleviate these things, we need to get our public transit in order. And that's, that's, the, that's the kicker. I mean, we can't control gas, but if we could get some sort of reliable public transit in, in the city, in the GTA, or out to Hamilton, or whatever it is, that's, that's where the answer lies. I can't wait for the electric cars to come. This is crazy. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Toronto. Toronto police are searching for a suspect after an officer was struck by a vehicle in a parking lot in Scarborough tonight. It happened near Kennedy Road and Ellesmere at around 6.15. Police say the driver fled the scene. The officer was taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Now, the car, a white Toyota, was recovered nearby, but the suspect is still at large. And three people were rushed to hospital after a multi vehicle crash near Markham Road and Finch. It happened at around 5.30 tonight. Police say three vehicles were involved in the collision in the intersection. Now, all three victims were taken to a trauma center. The intersection was shut down for the police investigation. And Toronto Police giving an update this afternoon on the record number of carjackings in the city. Now, this comes a day after we told you about the sharp spike in vehicle thefts in Toronto. A police announcing today two new arrests and naming two other suspects while warning the public not to fight back if approached. Chris Glover has more. Right there is the window that I was able to see the lights from my Jeep 
When Tommy Conto saw his Jeep's lights flashing in the driveway at 2.45 this morning, he ran outside to investigate. He says one young guy was already in his Jeep and ultimately tried to reverse into him, while another with a bunch of computer equipment ended up threatening Contos with a gun. Honestly, the amount of adrenaline and just, you know, it's, it's frustration to a level where you want to make sure that you're paying attention because I've been hearing so many people that I personally know uh, getting their cars stolen. The communities at a whole are, are feeling the effects of these carjackings and that's, what I, that's mostly what I'm here to do, to reassure the public that we will continue to do everything we can. Today, the Toronto Police Hold Up Squad announced two recent unrelated carjacking arrests, bringing the total arrested this year alone to 50. 56 stolen vehicles have been recovered. So far this year, 182 carjackings. For context, in all of 2021, there were 102. It is a plague that is getting worse and not better. Back in May, Mayor John Tory promised more enforcement and blamed organized crime. Today, the holdup squad says often there's no evidence of organized crime. High and low end vehicles are being swiped, often at night and often at gunpoint. Whether or not they're doing it for um, initiation reasons or joyriding whatsoever, the fact remains is that they're actually, um, there's a huge propensity for violence. Police say 18-year-old Jasmine Ung of York Region is wanted for alleged carjackings this summer. And 20-year-old Samir Ejaz, who had been out on bail for an alleged carjacking, is at large after allegedly removing his ankle monitoring device. Honestly, I think there's nothing to brag about when you're catching the scapegoats, in my opinion. Like, these kids... They're nothing to the people that are in charge. That's why they're the ones doing the legwork. Ganto says authorities must make it harder for illegal guns to flow over the U.S. border. And carjackers need harsher punishment to stop emboldening them before the next time the suspect pulls the trigger. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Let's go to Dali Ashri now with a first look at your forecast. And Dali, lots of sunshine again today. Night's definitely getting cooler, though. That's right, Kelda. I mean, typical seasonal temperatures, we're having those cooler nights and then those daytime highs with those clear skies and sunny conditions. Uh, we are sitting around seasonal temperatures, so we can't ask for more, really. Uh, the daytime high in Toronto today, 18 degrees, and then tomorrow it's going to feel even warmer than that, but we'll get to that in a bit. A little cooler out in St. Catherine, 17 degrees, uh, and it will get cooler by the end of the week. But let's take a look at our radar right here. We're not seeing any snow or rain. Uh, for most of the province, really. I mean, yesterday we saw a frost advisor that was in effect for some parts of Ontario. Uh, but right now, all we're talking about is this high pressure system that's moving across the province, giving us mainly clear skies and sunny conditions. A little bit of cloud condition will uh, be expected for Thursday evening as we head into Friday, and some windy conditions as well in Toronto as we head into Thursday. Winds gusting up to 23 kilometers and increasing. As for tonight, temperatures will drop and become a little cool. It'll be 9 degrees and tomorrow 22. Thanks so much, Dahlia. Come next summer, you may find your air conditioning kicking in less frequently. Now that's if you sign on to a new program the province is bringing in to help conserve energy. Lorena Redekop explains. The one thing I will say is that businesses and homeowners across the province want to save money. The government feels cost will ensure these energy efficiency programs are popular. One is for homes with central air conditioning and a smart meter. Enrolling would mean an incentive if they lower usage on some hot summer afternoons when demand is highest. Another geared at greenhouses with an incentive to install LED lighting or other energy saving measures. The programs start next year, costing $342 million dollars. Very confident uh, that because of the programs that are put forward it will reduce our reliance on natural gas generation in the province and it will also cut down our need for new generation. The four programs were all recommended by the independent electricity system operator. People have needed that help for the last four years and they weren't getting it. The opposition NDP says this is all as people are paying more for natural gas more than four years into this government. When they came in, they cut renewable energy contracts. We need that power. They cut the conservation programs. We needed those programs. They didn't actually have a plan in place. 
This is not a good way to manage an electricity system. And it's as electricity demand is expected to increase, with vehicles just one thing, moving to electric. This is a welcome step after the government uh, cut conservation spending in its first term. But this environmentalist calls the expected reductions in energy use due to this program meager. It's going to be overshadowed by the broader plan, which is to use more fossil gas for electricity production um, and the plan to expand natural gas pipelines to new homes, both of which are increasing our greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario. The government says the programs will save enough electricity to power 130,000 homes every year. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. New numbers confirm what a lot of parents already knew. Kids were less physically active during the pandemic as their screen time soared. But interestingly, there is some good news in this. So while the structured stuff disappeared, we learned again that we can play outside. We can use green spaces. We can find the trails that exist. Trail use went way up. And so participation recommends more of that. Go play outside, even as more structured activities like gym class or play dates come back into our lives. And by the way, the rise in screen time is so sharp, the report card gives kids an F in that category. Well, it's official. The Blue Jays are not only going to play in the Wild Card Series, they're going to host it this weekend at the Rogers Centre. And they now know who their opponent will be. The team will be hosting the Seattle Mariners in the best of three playoff series that begins on Friday. As Greg Ross tells us, having those games here not only has fans pumped, it has local businesses celebrating as well. Swing it and drive. Get up, Bob. Get out. After the Jays clinched home field advantage for the wildcard series last night, the scramble is on here in Toronto for fans trying to get tickets. Yeah, I've got uh, tickets for all the games for the playoffs, so excited for that. Hopefully they go deep. Not everybody was so lucky. Actually, I was looking to get some tickets and I was not able to do so. Some fans will have to choose between their team and their family. I'm going to miss new uh, Thanksgiving. <laughs> for this, right? So if my parents are watching, I'm sorry. It's my dad's birthday on Friday. We'll be there Sunday. But it's not every year fans get a chance to see moments like this. And the atmosphere is unbelievable. I think in uh, all of uh, Major League Baseball, Toronto has some of the best fans. Here comes Matt Chapman. And it's not just fans feeling the excitement. The energy in the city is electric. Natalia Di Carvalho is the floor manager at the Fox and the Fiddle, just steps from the Rogers Center. She says they're planning for a big playoff run. So we're putting one tent over the patio bar here. We've actually got live music um, planned for all, all every night of the week. They bring us the customers. Game one of that wild card series goes here at the Rogers Center on Friday. They'll play game two on Saturday. And if necessary, game three is scheduled for Sunday. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Yankees slugger Aaron Judge has now officially broken the American League home run record with his 62nd tonight against the Texas Rangers. Now you'll remember last week, Judge tied the record here at the Rogers Center. Now unlike that home run, one lucky fan actually caught the ball tonight. Collectors estimate it could sell for millions of dollars. Welcome back. Michael Thompson says he will stay in the race for counsel, even though he is facing criminal charges. The city councillor for Ward 21 Scarborough Centre faces two counts of sexual assault, stemming from an alleged incident that happened in Muskoka in July. Now, last week, Thompson stepped down as deputy mayor in light of the allegations. Thompson released a statement on Twitter today saying he has confidence in the judicial system and will allow the process to unfold in the courts. With the Eglinton Crosstown LRT delayed yet again, some residents who live near the project are expressing concern about traffic problems caused by the construction. They say drivers have been using their residential street, Broadway Avenue, which runs north of Eglinton, to get around the delays. Our municipal affairs reporter, Sean Jeffords, reports. Bumper to bumper traffic lines, Broadway Avenue and cars zip through roundabout as drivers struggle to get around Eglinton LRT construction. 
It's a common sight for residents since work on the Crosstown got underway in 2015. In a lot of instances, it's like the perfunctory, I slowed down, what do you want? And many of those same residents are warning about the dangers of speeding drivers and increased traffic volumes as work on the project lingers. It was supposed to be completed in 2019, then 2020, then 2022, and there's no end date for it now. Mike Crawley has lived on Broadway Avenue for 30 years. He says construction for the Eglinton Crosstown has doubled or tripled traffic on his street during rush hour. It's a safety issue and it's lack of respect of vehicles for pedestrians. There, once you're inside a steel and glass capsule, you think you're impervious to all of what is going on outside you. With two schools in the street, it's a dangerous mix, he says. It's been really an endemic problem for the last 10 years. Toronto District School Board Trustee Rachel Chernos Lynn says there hasn't been an easy solution. There's speed bumps, there's roundabouts as traffic calming measures. But I think, you know, 10 years of subway construction along Eglinton and lane restrictions at Bayview and Eglinton in particular have meant that motorists are looking for different ways around it. A crossing guard has been added to help children make the trip safely, but it continues to be a concern. Further enforcement from the police might be necessary, she says. I think that's that's a piece of the puzzle that we do need their partnership in in uh, penalizing motorists who are speeding, who are making turns when they're not allowed to make turns, who are cutting through neighborhoods when they're not allowed, um, because these these restrictions are meant to preserve uh, the safety of our pedestrians and and the quiet of our neighborhoods. Councillor Jay Robinson says in a statement that traffic along residential streets near the LRT construction has been extremely disruptive. She says she's alerted Toronto police and they intend to conduct enforcement blitzes in the area. Sean Jeffords, CBC News, Toronto. You are looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline. Clear skies tonight and remaining clear overnight. Currently, it is 11 degrees downtown. Let's go back to Dahlia now with a look at your long range forecast and Dahlia tomorrow looking pretty warm. Might be a nice day to uh, take a stroll outside. That's right, Kelda. I mean, today was a nice stroll for a park outside as well, but really tomorrow is when you want to stay out more, especially after work. And as well on Thursday, uh, mostly sunny conditions. That means sunglasses weather. And then by the evening, temperatures will drop a little cooler. And then we will see some breezy conditions as well uh, towards the end of the week. Now, the daytime high in Toronto today, 18 degrees, a little warmer out in Kitchener, 21 degrees. And we will be seeing similar uh, temperatures tomorrow afternoon. No rain in sight and no snow as well. However, don't let that fool you. The S word snow will be around the corner for some parts of Ontario as that cold front starts to make its way through and that Arctic air starts to make its way across the province as well. Thursday night heading into Friday going into the long weekend. But as you can see here with that high pressure system, mainly clear skies, but then Thursday really here at 11 o'clock. So Thursday night heading into Fridays when Toronto might experience some rain and we see those cloudy conditions as well. As for tonight, overnight, temperatures will drop to 9 degrees, a little cooler out in other parts of the Golden Horseshoe, like Markham, Oshawa, and Mississauga, 6 degrees, and much colder out in Hamilton, 5 degrees. Now, as for the next few days, mostly dry conditions. As we head into the long weekend, though, on Friday, uh, there is a 40% chance of rain, and that's because of the Arctic air that I was talking about earlier and that cold front system that's making its way through. But really, as we take a look at Wednesday and Thursday, look Look at that we're in the 20s and that's because of that high pressure system but then we see almost a 10 degree decrease from thursday to friday from 20 to 13 degrees and then that 13 degrees will also stick around for saturday and sunday 15 degrees so it starts to get a little bit cooler over the long weekend uh, and then we'll see that sunshine again by sunday towards the end of the long weekend kelda thanks so much Dad. For Indigenous communities, sacred fires are important ceremonies. They usher in new seasons and make space for healing and expression. These ceremonies, though, would sometimes be shut down because they violated park bylaws. But as of today, seven Toronto parks are now dedicated spaces for these sacred fires. Ali Shiasong has more. Those are inherited rights as Indigenous people to have these fires so that we can do our ceremonies, so that we can honour those that have passed on to the spirit world and are now sitting with our creator. 
to celebrate the seasons, which we do four times a year, to mark milestones for our community. Norwood Park is one of three Toronto parks that now have dedicated sacred fire spaces. Each site will be inspected by the city and managed by Indigenous neighbours. And so this is so important that we have spaces now where we can, you know, make that reconciliation uh, part of a reality with non-Indigenous and Indigenous community. So this is a very important date. Uh, our fire keeper is here, Johnny. Johnny Moore remembers when people would call the authorities on their sacred fires. I've been keeping uh, fire for over 30 years and uh, in the last three decades here in Toronto. Uh, and we've had a lot of experience with the fire department and the police department and uh, city bylaw workers. But you know what? Uh, I respect that and understand that because they didn't know. Now, through coordination and collaboration between the city and community, these ceremonies can be held without worry or interruption. I, I'm so happy, you know, to be a part of this and to also contribute. We are deeply honoured to have been invited to take part in the, the ceremony today and uh, we consider it a very sincere privilege to be here with you today. So the actual fire itself is sacred, so we can't film that part, but I will take the time to tell you now that this has been a long time coming. The Indigenous community have been asking the city to sanction these sacred fires to be allowed to happen in city parks. Finally, through the coordination of the bylaw office, the fire department and Indigenous affairs, they've made it happen. For our community members, for our brothers and sisters, for our aunties, and most of all, for those who are no longer here, who had hoped to see this in their, their time when they walked as a human being. So we are fulfilling our ancestors' dreams, that we carry on with our, our culture, carry on with our ceremonies, carry on with our songs, carry on in the way we honour each other, and to create true reconciliation so that we can live peacefully, work peacefully, and exist peacefully in the same spaces. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. That is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Dwight Drummond has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.